Good day everyone. My talk today is about historic landfills as a source of groundwater contamination by PFAS. It is part of the master's thesis of my students Victoria and Tammy, who are co-supervised by Jim Smith at McMaster, uh, with help from Amila, Christine, Sue, and Sarah from Environment and Climate Change Canada. PFAS are per- and polyfluoroalkylated substances. They're a group of over 4,000 organic compounds that have carbon chains containing the super strong carbon fluorine bond. An example of one of the first developed is given here, PFOA. It has an eight carbon chain uh, with the seven carbons fully fluorinated. These compounds are difficult to break down in nature and so have been termed forever chemicals. They are of environmental concern to both human health and aquatic ecosystems because they are persistent, accumulative, mobile, either in the water phase or the air phase, and hazardous or toxic. To date, there's few uh, water guidelines uh, related to PFAS compounds. It's fair to say that these are in a state of development with limits um, getting smaller over time. In Canada, we have a drinking water guideline for two chemicals, PFOS and PFOA, uh, and the EPA in the States has an advisory one for PFOS plus PFOA, which is quite a bit smaller. There's even more uncertainty for guidelines protecting aquatic ecosystems. As you can see here in comparing the one from Canada for PFOS to the one from the European Council. The first PFAS were commercialized around 1960, and many are still used today. The uses of PFAS are quite broad, as you can see here, uh, from things that we use in our households every day to more specialized uses, such as in firefighting foam. The concern for PFAS contamination of groundwater has really grown over the past decade or so. Some of the initial focus was on its use in firefighting foams with contamination at uh, military bases and airports. But we now know that PFAS is also found in leachate of landfills, or at least modern landfills. There's much less known about PFAS in old landfills. The concern with historic landfills, the term I'm using for those closed greater than 25 years ago, compared to modern landfills, is that they tend to pose a greater threat of contaminating local groundwater and subsequently nearby surface waters. This is because they typically lack engineered liners and leachate collection systems, have had less restrictive waste acceptance criteria, and are often in low-lying areas near surface waters. And while these historic landfills tend to be smaller than modern ones, this isn't necessarily a small problem it might even be considered a regional problem. With over 4,000 old landfills spread across Ontario. The work I'm sharing today is part of a broader study with the objective to better understand the threat posed to surface waters by groundwater contaminated by historic landfills. A key focus of the study is on PFAS exposure, both spatially and temporally, and mass inputs, though we are considering other pollutants as well. The three key zones for exposure are the endobenthic zone, the epibenthic zone, and the pelagic zone. The first part of the study is a leachate survey to determine what is there in the source. The second part involves field investigations at two sites with a known landfill plume impacting a surface water body. For this we are making hydrology and contaminant measurements and then adding to this ecotoxicology measures though this last part is still in progress and I won't be discussing it today. Our study consisted of a survey of 20 closed landfills in Ontario. Now because these closed landfills don't have a built-in leachate collection system, we had to get samples with whatever means necessary, including leachate containment systems or culverts, wells, seeps, or discharging groundwater at surface water bodies. What this means is that the majority of our samples aren't pure leachate, but are leachate-affected groundwater. 
17 PFAS compounds were analyzed by ultra-high performance liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. The concentrations of the dominant 10, seen here, are stacked here to give total PFAS in micrograms per liter. 20 landfills are noted on the x-axis with 2 to 5 samples per site and are plotted roughly by closing date with the oldest to the left. For context, total PFAS concentrations of 2 to 30 micrograms per liter have been found for modern landfills, while concentrations of several tens of micrograms per liter have been reported at firefighter training sites. Now looking at this data, first we can see that concentrations are very low for the oldest landfills, which wasn't unexpected as these all closed prior to 1960 when PFAS was really coming to the market. The highest concentrations are for the DC sites here. <clears throat> these are all in the same city and all opened and closed in the early 1960s. For the rest, there's a fair bit of variability in concentrations between and within sites, part of which might be due to dilution in groundwater. But there is also much variability in the composition, with varying dominance between PFCA in purples and PFSA in greens, which is likely linked to source materials. Overall, PFAS was quite prevalent and it was not uncommon for total PFAS concentrations to surpass 0.5 micrograms per liter. Recall that some of these samples were groundwater seeping into or discharging to a surface water body. These are highlighted here and show that PFAS impacts from historic landfills may not be a rare occurrence. Other emerging contaminants found at notable concentrations in this survey include the organophosphate esters, bisphenols A and S, sulfamic acid, and cotinine, a nicotine derivative. The detailed field investigations took place over one year at two sites, one a creek site and the other a pond site. Measurements included groundwater and surface water levels, temperature and temperature gradients, stream flow, and field chemistry. And water samples were collected for artificial sweeteners, ammonium, nitrate, major ions, metals, with a select few analyzed for 27 compounds of PFAS. As a bit of background, many historic landfills do have some form of a monitoring program for protection of drinking wells and surface water ecosystems nearby. This monitoring involves sampling from wells and surface waters, usually once a year, uh, and includes analyses for major ions, ammonium, metals, and some volatile organics. I'll start with a pond site landfill. It was operated from 1970 to 1986 and is about 500 meters north to south. It is also the highest elevation on the site, and previous work shows groundwater mounding underneath the landfill and thus groundwater flow in the shallow aquifer in all directions, including to the west to this artificial pond. The pond here drains to the south from this outlet stream. The pond site landfill undergoes annual monitoring under Ontario regulations. This involves sampling of groundwater from monitoring wells, the red circles, and of nearby surface waters, the blue triangles. This monitoring program indicates some minor impact of a leachate plume on this artificial pond. Of course, the monitoring program does not include PFAS, yet at least. Our sampling of the lone leachate well gave a total PFAS concentration of 500 nanograms per liter. However, more detailed dry point sampling at the east edge of the pond indicated a maximum concentration of 2600 nanograms per liter in the discharging groundwater. This represents the exposure in the endobenthic zone and possibly the epibenthic zone above. Due to dilution, the concentration is much less in the pond and outlet stream, but may still pose an ecological risk. Taking a closer look at the endobenthic zone exposure to the pond, shown here flip so north is now to the right, our shallow dry point sampling along the edge and across the pond indicates a fairly substantial plume footprint with a crude estimate of one microgram per liter or a thousand nanograms per liter 
for the average total PFAS concentration. Other plume indicators indicate that the footprint remains fairly constant throughout the year. The other site involves the landfills along Diamonds Creek. These are three landfills which were each operational approximately one year back in the early 1960s. Diamonds Creek passes through and along these landfills and drains to Lake Simcoe. At this site we didn't have access to any leachate wells, but shallow groundwater sampling revealed total PFAS concentrations reaching over 20,000 nanograms per liter and PFOS up to 2,600 nanograms per liter, which is a little under half the current aquatic life guideline in Canada. For the stream itself, the concentrations were strongly diluted, but certainly non-negligible and above the European guideline for aquatic life. The main take-home message from this study is that historic landfills should be considered a source of PFAS contamination to groundwater and nearby surface waters, potentially impacting the endobenthic, epibenthic, and pelagic zones. This work was supported by the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks and Environment and Climate Change Canada, with student support from NSERC and OGS. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.